just our voices. our hearts tonight, Lord. Convict my heart tonight, Jesus. I welcome it. I long for your touch, Lord. Convict my heart tonight. Oh, in your holiness touches me. Convict my heart tonight. When I see your face, your presence manifest tonight. Oh, I should fall down and cry. I'm unclean. Oh, I'm unclean, Jesus. I'm struck. I am struck by the weight of the words. You are my one thing. How often do we sing, church? And what we sing does not line up with how we live. So many other things crowding in, taking my attention, becoming first in my life, second in my life, third in my life, fourth in my life. Where is Jesus? Where is Jesus? Where is Jesus? Oh, will you would convict our hearts? you long for the moments of your days to line up with the songs that we sing. This is not an indictment. This is not a judgment. Is it okay that it's a confession? I want you to be my one thing, Jesus. but I do not want to sit and sing and fake it. I don't want to just live where I prophesy what should be. I want to walk in what is. You are my one thing, Lord.
is what we stand on tonight, Jesus. Only and ever our need of you. You are our righteousness. You are the only defense that we need. As Jeremiah comes and opens your truth for us tonight, God, would we not ever step out of the atmosphere of us needing you. I will not step away from it, Jesus. I will not get distracted. I will not turn my thoughts to other things, but I need you. Oh, Jesus, I need you. What do you have to say, God? I'm open. I'm listening. Amen. I agree. I've got to have it. I can't go another day without you, Jesus. You've got to be my one thing. You've got to be my one thing. And all of his people said, Amen. You may be seated. In the name of Jesus. Father, help us understand tonight. I pray that you would give us ears to hear and eyes to see, Lord, that's beyond our mental capacity. Um, bring us beyond, Father, what we can mentally understand and speak to our hearts. bring revelation into our life that we're going to have to process and let it accompany let it be accompanied by your spirit as a testimony that it comes from you in the name of Jesus we pray amen I'm delighted thrilled and a little apprehensive about uh, tonight <laughs> I'm, I'm, it's, you're going to need your Bibles. In fact, I went around, I was looking, and there's some in front of the pew. If you have them, they're NIV. That'll be great. Uh, if you don't bring one, uh, if you didn't bring one, I understand, you know. If it's in your phone, that's even better. I love the digital stuff because you can swap back and forth and have like 10 Bibles open and all that. Uh, but I really want you to see this. And um, again, this came out of uh, as, as honest and as forthcoming as I can possibly be with you, this has been, this was like, this was like giving birth. I, I preached this study for the first time at the West Texas District Camp Meeting, and I literally argued with the Lord over it. And before I got up, it's on video, or it's, on, it's out there on the internet somewhere, West Texas District Camp, it's on video, I've seen it. And I got up, and I was like, I'm not really thrilled about talking to you about this tonight because I, it was, it's just, it took me a year to walk through this. And so, uh, you know, you, you begin to share something more and more and it's, it's, it becomes, it becomes a little easier, but then it changes and, oh, it's so, this is such a difficult because it's, we're looking at the lens by which the church in Ephesus operated so we're going to begin tonight in Ephesians chapter 6, but we're going to be bouncing around, probably look about seven or eight different scriptures, and I apologize, but we just got to do it. I've been fascinated by this lens that the early church lived by. And I'm with Sean. I love, I love what Sean said. Like, you know, we should never scold because he doesn't scold me. So why would I scold you? Yeah, so we don't, we don't ever, you're never going to hear that, okay, not, not from us. Um, but I am grieved, this is not a scolding thing, but I am grieved on what me as a preacher, you know, I, it dawned on me this year, you know, I, this is my 27th year preaching. It's crazy being only 36, you know, I mean, <laughs> that's what's so nuts about it, right? But... I've contributed, you know, I, I went back and listened to some of my sermons. I was like, oh, there's such a record out there. <laughs> but I've contributed to a lens where we default to the physical. I don't know how else to talk about it. They didn't default to the physical. And, and we almost scoff, and that's probably too strong. 
We doubt. I mean, there's a reason Paul said, literally, pray without ceasing. It's not tricky grammar. It means don't ever stop that communication. It's what we were just singing. It's what he was crying out. This is this unbroken kind of, I'm yours, you're mine. I operate in that. I mean, I, I too want that, like bad, like more than anything else in my life. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of things I like. But those are way down on the list from that one. And not only that, this, this unbroken prayer, but this taking captive every thought that I have and submitting it to the obedience of Christ. Because you don't know. And, and it's, it's just really true. You're not responsible for all the thoughts that come in your head. There is a tempter. There is you. There's thoughts that you have. Okay? But, but you are, I mean, you and I can be assaulted by a tempter. Someone who tempts. Jesus was. Who here has been tempted? Just raise your hand. Let's encourage one another. I mean, in case anybody thinks we're tempted, okay. Uh, do you know that if, first off, did you know that if you can hear the enemy, you can hear the Holy Spirit? Everyone can hear the Holy Spirit. Bef it, it's, it's not even a Christian thing. Conviction is a work of the Holy Spirit. You just don't decide to become a Christian. He speaks to you, your heart he is calling out to you. You and I were created, this is, this is the punchline, you and I were created to operate in that realm. We were created. When you come into the, this letter that Paul writes to the church in Ephesus, five times, five times, he mentions heavenly realms. Five times. And what's more is that's plural. Heavenly places. Like there's more. And I was like, what is, is he talking about just different places in the heavens? And I ended up going back to Genesis, which we're going to talk about in a minute. And I began looking. And the first verse opened up. And I was like, in the beginning, God created the. That's plural. I was like, how am I just learning this <laughs> after 27 <laughs> Yeah, how am I just now just dawning on me? There's more than one. So I go through out all the New Testament. And I'm looking for all of these heavenly places. And I bump into some places. Well, first off, I bump into 1 Corinthians where Paul talks about he knows a man, probably talking about himself. Scholars suggest that. And I, I, I have to believe him because I'm not as smart as they are. But he says he talks about a man who goes to the third heavens. He went to the third heaven. Now, some people talk about there's the seven heaven and all these different. Well, that's not in scripture. Okay? So they just talk about three. There's the third heaven. And I'm not great with math, but I assume if there's a third heaven, I'm just assuming, being honest with you. Just, I am. I'm just assuming that there's three. That's, that's, that's really honest with you. I'm like, I have to assume if there's a third heaven, there's going to be a first and a second. And the third heaven is described pretty explicitly in several different places in terms of how Paul describes it. And John talks about it in Revelation chapters 4 and 5. It's the place where God dwells. It is the unsullied by sin place. Satan is not allowed there. He has been ousted. Okay? That is the place that belongs to God. There's nothing that resists him in that place. It's the, heaven, it's, it's the third heavens. It's this throne room kind of a place. Now, there's a, there's a, there's a place that seems to be what we, what, and scholars suggest this, and I, come, I agree with it. There seems to be a place called the, the first heavens. And that seems to be everything that's not on the physical earth. Uh, in, in several times in the Gospels, Jesus talks about the birds of the sky. You read that passage? That word sky is heavens. I was like, really? I didn't know that. That's the word heavens. The clouds in the heavens, the stars in the heavens. And so there's this heavens that's not earth, that's physical that we can see with our physical eye. Mankind is, has been created and placed here. I've been trying to get a hold of Elon Musk. Respond to his tweets. I got on Twitter for that purpose. I'm like, listen, save your money. Don't go to Mars. We ain't gonna make it. 
Seriously, I really believe that Jesus is coming back here. You're wasting a lot of money. It's a freebie. I really believe that. And I have been messaging. He ain't responding. I just keep sending him. Don't go to Mars. You ain't going to make it. It's a waste of money. Anyway, that's a bonus. So there's the first heaven, physical stuff we can see. There's the third heaven. And then there's the, say, what about the second heaven? That seems to be reserved for this kind of stuff. It's the spiritual forces. Listen to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. Paul, who's talked about this heavenly realms place where we are equipped. You are not equipped physically. You are equipped spiritually. When you and I get saved, we don't change physically. Our countenance can change. There's some effects that the spiritual has on the physical. But it's not like you go smarter or stronger. This ain't Samson stuff. You are equipped there. We'll talk about that here in a little bit. So he comes down to chapter 6, verse 12. This is the last. This is number 5, so we only have to look at the other four. But he says, for our struggle, that means fight, is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. That is where we wrestle. Your problem is not physical. So storming the Capitol with a bunch of guns isn't the answer. Getting even, and listen, I've got my political opinions. We all do. But the idea that we can fix our nation by just putting a new guy in the house, that ain't cutting it. Say amen. Seriously, that's not cutting it. That ain't going to cut it. We need revival, man. We need a movement of the living God that changes the hearts of men. That's what we have to have. The answer for our world is spiritual, not physical reform. I'm all for physical reform. Absolutely, 100%. Got a whole list. Got a wife who's got more, okay? She's the aggressive one. But the answer for our world is spiritual. The problem most of the time And I would say, and again, I I say I use that language. He doesn't use that language. Our struggle is not. That means never. I would feel more comfortable. He's like, well, sometimes. And I did, man. And I can't go through the whole study because I went back and I was like, listen, Paul, you know, he's eccentric. He's he's probably exaggerating or maybe this is metaphorical. Because I could go all the way through the New Testament and I could look at the opponents of Jesus that were physical. He was dealing with physical guys, had physical issues. Physical stuff, physical opponents. But what if the real issue behind those opponents were spiritual and not physical? When Jesus says stuff like, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. Yeah, they do. Don't they? See, we just live by, they just live by a different lens. See, I think it's that guy. What if it's not that guy? If that guy is actually called by God and created by God, he's just living in deception. See, what if that's the real issue? Paul says, you do not wrestle. Your issue, you have physical problems, there's physical deals, but dude, those will work themselves out. That's not a big, the real issue has to be spiritual. Once that's solved, that stuff just works itself out. That's, that's their lens. So before we talk about this, just really quickly, I want to give some context because this really used to worry me, still worries me. I don't like when I hear it because it's not necessarily correct. It's not right on. It's a little off. And I think I said this already, but you understand Jesus, and this is not for hype. This is the truth. Jesus won the war. Okay. So we're we're victorious. We're seated in Christ. We're going to look at this. We're seated in Christ above every title that can be given, not only in this age, but in the age to come. We're seated with him where he's at. He is our inheritance. Okay, so Satan is defeated. You're not demon slayers. Okay, yeah, you're not going to go out. Jesus never, ever, I can't find any place where he comes into Jerusalem and goes, where are you at, Satan? He never did that. Ever. At the most... A demonic being will confront him and he'll say, shoe fly, don't bother me. Go away. The enemy, it's it literally the, for the child of God, this sounds crazy. The child, of, this is so good. For the child of God, the enemy is absolutely inconsequential. He's irrelevant. Oh, now you're going to be like, are you sure? 
trust me. I want to walk you through this. This is their lens. So the war, you don't fight demons, okay? You're not a demon hunter. That's, he's not your focus. You are seated in Christ. The war is over. Okay, that's, that's really big, really big. Okay, so heavenly realms. So in looking at all of this and created for that realm, my first response, honestly, and this is, I, I, it was, looking back on it, it was really humorous. At the time it wasn't. I was dealing with some real family issues and I'm studying all this and I just felt like I was being bombarded. And I was like, Lord, why did you involve us? I've got enough drama in my life. I just, I wish you would take your angels and the demon, just go to a different galaxy. Just settle it there, come back. And it was so clear. I don't hear the Lord very clearly, I, I think, most of the time. But I heard him this time. He's like, I didn't bring him into this. You did. I was like, touche. <laughs> and I did. And I, saw, I was like, when, where did this all begin? And I went back to the book of Genesis, which we're not going to look at specifically. And I was like, I'm just going to go back to the very beginning, which is where I found all the heavenly realm stuff. And, but what, I be, what began to dawn on me, as I began to see all kinds of things that were in the beginning that were around before in the beginning. I was like, that's weird. For instance, you, you don't get very far. Obviously, God's there. He was around from, you know, before the beginning. But there are angels. You have a cherub in chapter 3 that's the flaming sword. He was around. Where'd he come from? You have Lucifer also in chapter 3. And he's not only an angel, but he's a fallen angel. Which means all that war stuff that we read about in the scriptures happened before we came along. I mean, there were five days of creation before we came along on day six. As scholars are divided, some think people believe it happened way before, before creation began. I happen to believe it happened sometime during the midst of all the creation. I'm going to give you some evidence of that. And we have an adversary, singular, okay? He's Lucifer. He's the one that attacked, tempted, came after Jesus. He's, he's mentioned all throughout the scriptures. And he led a third of the host of heaven astray. And those, that is, our, that is our enemy who has been defeated and whom opposes you. He tries to buffet you. He tests you. Lies to you. He's a deceiver. He first comes on the scene. I want to give you just a couple page, uh, passages. And I want you to look at this for yourself. And it's, again, it's a part of, it's a part of, um, maybe we'll come back to that one. He's talked about in Ephesians chapter 2. As the ruler of, verse 2, as the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Remember that verse, or we're going to come back to them, or I may just reference it. He's the ruler of the kingdom of the air. That's really important. He's ruler of the kingdom of the air. Well, who is that? Who's Paul talking about? So you have all these demonic beings. And by the way, there's several. There's, in, in, in chapter 6, if you remember, he said there are rulers which is the word for principalities. There are authorities. There are powers. There are spiritual forces of evil, like almost like some scholars call them foot soldiers. And all of them are underneath this ruler, chapter 2, verse 2, of the prince of the air, who is, who is Lucifer, who is Satan. He first makes his appearance in the Old Testament uh, in Ezekiel chapter 28. Two passages, and scholars are divided on pretty much everything, but there's just overwhelming support that these two spiritual descriptions, these, this spiritual being description is our enemy. And it's, it's significant, and let me also give you this really quickly. There's no easy way. I've tried every different way to describe and kind of the gentle way to kind of walk us through this. So it's, it's a lot of information, but we're going to continue to kind of pull it together. The lens that the early church viewed their world is that there was a spiritual world that was more significant than the physical world. And that God doesn't de desire just physical activities like going to church, reading your Bible, not doing bad things, doing good things. God desires us to walk with him and participate here. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. 
And it's again, we, we, that's interesting. I hear people talk, you know, well, we need to pray. Yeah, we, we should pray. We got to do something. That's America. That's that tip. That's how I hear a lot of the American Christians on Facebook talk. We need to physically do something. Most of the time, that's wrong. The early church's weight was here. And it's bizarre they didn't resist. I still wrestle with that. I like put myself in line waiting to go into the lion's den. I don't think I'd have just been standing there because I'm an American. I'd have been killed before I got out of the gate. And in my military marine mind, I'd have taken several with me. I confess. Why? That's how we think. It's like they just, they, had, they operated totally different. That, and by the way, that came right out of an old covenant time period. For example, Ezekiel chapter 28, this word of the Lord comes to Ezekiel the prophet. This is, of course, before Babylon, you know, uh, uh, comes on the scene. And, and Ezekiel is supposed to give this word of the Lord against this, it says in verse 2, the ruler, probably better, better translated their king, because that kind of ruler is a human ruler of Tyre. And this guy calls himself a God. You can see that down in verse 2. He, I, he says, I am a God. I sit on the throne of a God in the heart of the seas. Okay, so this guy just thinks he's all that. He's, and, and, and so Ezekiel gives this judgment. God says, I want you to give this pronouncement of judgment against this physical king who says that he's a God. So go to say to him, you say you're a God, well, you're actually going to die. You're not a God. You're physical. But when you come down at the end of verse 12, he says, actually in verse 12, no, verse 11, he's, the Lord comes to him and says, listen, let me tell you why this guy is acting this way. It's a ridiculous study. He says, let me tell you why this guy is acting this way. Because this guy who is physical down here, he's being acted upon and has surrendered himself to the lies of a spiritual being. He's being manipulated. And so I want you to give another pronouncement of judgment, not just against the physical king, but the spiritual ruler of Tyre. And he says at the end of 12, he's supposed, to, he's supposed to say this. This is what the sovereign Lord says. You were the model of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Listen to this. You were in Eden, the garden of God. I searched everywhere for a spiritual Eden. Everywhere, every commentary, theological dictionary in the New Testament, which is a history of theology throughout the church, all the way back to the early church, and, and their, their references to Aristotle. I mean, it searched everywhere. Physical Eden. It's the only place he's talking about. He goes on after just saying he's, he was in the Garden of Eden. He says, get this, every precious stone adorns you. All of these are physical. So there's a linkage between this spiritual being, Lucifer, and the earth. Like there's this created linkage for the creation of the earth. Like there's things that are created. When he was created, they were together. Listen how it's described. Every precious stone adorns you. Ruby, topaz, emerald, chrysolite, onyx, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and beryl. All of those are physical earthly stones. The best of what we have on earth. Your settings and mountings were made of gold. On the day you were created, they were prepared for you. You can translate that. On the day they were created, they, on the day you were created, they were also prepared for you. And then it says this: you were anointed. That's a calling kind of an idea. As a guardian cherub, for so I ordained you. Really quick, ordination is a really big deal. Had to make this short. Ordination is a really big deal. Uh, Sean was still there. I was at, we was at Cross Style one time, and I was preaching that Sunday, and this guy shows up in the parking lot with his girlfriend living out of their car. They did, I thought they were married. They weren't. And he comes up, and he says, hey, I'm a man of God, and I have a message, and I want to come into your church and preach. I was like, uh, yeah, that ain't happening. I said, but you can come. We'd love you to come. He's like, you would turn away a prophet of the Lord? I said, I would, Physically. You had to have been there. That, that, right, that was probably here. But yeah, anyway, so I said, you're not coming in. And I explained to him in the parking lot about it. He goes, I have a call. I said, I get that. But what ordination is, everybody can, anybody can say they have a call, and maybe everybody does have a call. But ordination is huge. Ordination is where a body of believers recognize that call and give a platform for that call to be exercised. 
That is a big deal. In our denomination, it takes like over a decade. It takes over a decade for, a, and there's, there's accountability, there's, there's educational accountability, there's a lot that goes in. In other words, and it's very vocal. It's very, we stand behind this person. In our denomination, like it's like two years with a local license, I think it's four to six years for a district license. Oh, you can drag that dude out forever. And then there's like some, some full-time uh, ministerial time, and then there's part-time, and there's all these kind of, you know, edu- all this, all this you know, studies and academic stuff. And then it is a big deal when they lay their hands on you and they're saying, hey, we believe in this guy, and we're, letting, we're giving him a platform, and our whole denomination's getting behind him. That's ordination. It's very vocal. Satan had that. He was not just anointed as a guardian cherub, but it was ordained, which means all the host, everyone saw this. It was very vocal. Now, he was not, he was, he was a guardian cherub. He was kind of like a guard dog. Jude tells us don't slander your celestial beings. I'm not. It, he's a guard dog. He wasn't created with phenomenal cosmic powers. He was ordained very specifically, linked with the earth. In the, so I've always wondered, how did he get in the garden? Seriously, how did he get there? Come on. In the snake thing? Really? How many snakes did they talk to? They had these questions. How did he get there? Well, he was ordained there. That's how they knew. You have a little bit more information if you want to turn to Isaiah chapter 14, pick it up in verse 12, Isaiah also, Isaiah also receives from the Lord a pronouncement. And it's interesting, while you're turning there, you see consistently, and we're going to give you a couple examples of this, you see consistently in the Old Testament where Satan and his forces are operating in the spiritual realm over the physical lives of individuals who seemingly don't have a say in it. It's really interesting. After the fall of Adam, mankind is plunged, and they're no longer able to participate in that spiritual realm. For, listen to me, for 4,000 years, for 4,000 years, they operated were under the mercy of this adversary. In chapter, uh, chapter 14, beginning at verse 12, Isaiah has this lament, and he begins in verse 12, How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. That's a terrible translation. If you ever want to study that particular line, it's not what you think it means. It literally has to do with uh, groups of people and authorities and going and gossiping and turning and laying low. It's it's, it's, uh, kingdoms, that kind of an idea, spiritual. Verse 13, You said in your heart, listen to this. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. This is so good. Listen to this. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly on the uttermost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds and I will make myself like the most high. You'd say, where did he get that idea? And what was the major downfall of the enemy? He wanted to be like the Most High. And God just thrusted something in my mind eventually. And I went back and looked at Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, and how we were created on the sixth day. God created us in his image and his likeness. That word likeness and what Satan coveted like the Most High are the exact same word. Satan, and there was this picture that began to form. Satan was created, and there was this linkage that he was created, ministering spirits, sent those to serve those who inherit salvation. He was put in, on earth as a guard dog in the Garden of Eden, and he began to lust, and he began to covet after what Adam and Eve carried. And they were created in, come on, get excited, this is good stuff. He was, they, they were created in the image and likeness of God, and Satan wanted what they had. And he went after them and usurped that. And all throughout the Old Testament, and this is so interesting, I want you to look at this really quickly. Luke chapter 4. Verses 5 and 6. Jesus, now we're going to go back. 
this is what Satan stole from Adam. This is remarkable. He's tempting Jesus and he's bragging. He takes Jesus up on a high mountain in verse 5, and the devil led him up to a high place, showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. Listen to this. He said, I will give you all of their authority and splendor, for it has been given to me, and I can give it to whoever I want to. You're like, who gave him that? Adam gave him that. He wasn't created for that. And all the way through an Old Testament, Satan's everywhere. He was created as a guardian cherub in the Garden of Eden. That's where he was created. And you see him, he's like walking up into the throne room of God, taunting about Job, telling God, I own the whole world. God's like, you don't own Job. And you have all this activity going on here. Job's never invited to the meeting. Poor guy. And you, seriously, you have all throughout the Old Testament... In our world, you have two things going on. Most people are unaware of this. Completely unaware of this. They think every thought that they have belongs to them. The deception that they live in. I had a guy call me the other day. He's out of, he was out of Kansas City. He went to a school where I preached uh, at this Christian high school back in the early 2000s or late early 2000s. He called me and he said, I need help. I said, what's wrong? He goes, I'm hearing voices in the middle of the night. He goes, I need to take my medication, but I don't want to take it anymore. And I've got schedule. I was like, dude, you... He's like, I just have some mental stuff. I was like, I don't think that's just mental stuff. He goes, it's telling me to hurt myself and hurt my family. He's completely oblivious. I'm like, you slept in chapel. I knew it. <laughs> He's completely oblivious to this world. I mean, completely well, it's a medical condition. That's our world. That seriously, that's this we live here, completely ignorant of this. They didn't. Like these two worlds are. Satan takes Jesus up and says, It's all mine. It's been given to me. I give it to whoever I want. You can have it if you bow down. Jesus is like, dude, I'm taking it back. Yeah, I'm taking it back. Do you know why Satan came after us? I wonder why. And seriously, the psalmist, Psalm chapter 8, Hebrews chapter 2, don't go there. What is man that you're mindful of him? Come on, you were created in the image of God, man. You were created to house his DNA, that spiritual DNA that would literally God wanted to go on in the physical. You were created to spread that. You are the DNA of God. You're the vehicle you're the, you were to be, Adam and Eve were the expressed image of the invisible God. We learn a lot about the first Adam from looking at the second Adam. The last Adam, Jesus. He was born just like, I mean, just perfect, unscarred relation, just like the first one was. And Satan was jealous of what he carried. I'm telling you, he, the enemy is absolutely terrified of you realizing and embracing who you are in Christ. He's absolutely terrified because you, he knows you're going to walk around just like Jesus did, just, just, just totally unconcerned with the enemy and what he's doing. You'd have no power over me unless it was granted to you. Satan didn't even have permission to enter Judas until Jesus gave him that permission. Go back and read that verse. Go back and read that whole scene where Satan enters, enters Judas. There's this scene, there's this whole Old Testament time period where Satan usurps. He desires to be seated. He desires to go to the, what is he describing? He's describing who Adam was before he fell. And he operates in that for 4,000 years. Now, what's really significant, let me give you just a couple examples of this. Are we okay so far? Your eyes are like this big around, it gets better. Look with me at Jer Jericho chapter 5. Or Joshua chapter 5. It says Jericho right in front of me. I'm really excited. <laughs> we're going to look at Jericho. We're going to look at Jericho. Look with me at Joshua chapter 5, and we're going to pick up at verse 13. And again, this is illustrative. There's a point that I want to make to you, what I, what I begin to discover. And I'm trying to just paint a picture for you as gracefully as I can. In an old covenant time period, mankind lost 
the authority and became slaves to sin. Completely dominated. Oppressed by the enemy. And from time to time, this spiritual war that was going on like breaks through. Hear this. The significance of the spiritual realm that you and I now have access to in Christ, which we're going to get to in a minute, they didn't have access to in the Old Testament. They longed to look into what you and I have. John the Baptist, greatest in the Old Covenant hour, least in the kingdom of heaven, is greater than he is. Why? Because it was Old Covenant. They don't have what we have. They don't sit where we're seated. They didn't receive the promise. We did. And in the old covenant hour, you see physical mankind living in a world that's being dominated by the spiritual. This is such a good story. You, most of us know it. But in, uh, of course, there's been, a, there's been several skirmishes and all of this deal. And Joshua is walking to scout out uh, Jericho In verse 13, it says, Now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua just, you can feel the testosterone just rolling off of him. And he goes up to him, he goes, Are you for us or for our enemies? And it's hysterical. The guy goes, Neither. And Joshua's like, What do you mean, neither? Dude, do you know my name? I'm kind of a big deal. Yeah. Yeah, I'm commander of the Lord's army. And he's like, No, 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 I'm commander of the Lord's army. Which is crazy. And you're like, hold on. No, no, Joshua is the commander of the Lord's army. Yeah, there's two commanders of the Lord's army. There's the commander of the Lord's army and the the Lord's army. Because he he does have an army. And then there's the commander of the Lord's army and then there's the Lord's army. And And he talks to Joshua and he goes down and he gives him some specific instruction. This is hysterical. Look at verse two of chapter six. Just a couple verses down. This guy says who people call him the Korean, he's the angel of the Lord, the pre-incarnate Christ, some people call him. I, don't, I haven't figured that part out yet. But he says in verse two, see, I have delivered Jericho into your hands along with its king. And his, Dude, the war's over. Joshua's gonna go sc- scout out the situation. What's going on? And by the way, this is a consistent theme in the Old Testament. How are we gonna fight? We'll line up all the worship people first. Here, hold up his hands. Take these 300 boneheads. Dude, it, it, nothing's changed. The battle was always the Lord's. It was always the Lord's. It's not physical. By the time you get to the early church, they, they got, they've had this figured out. Paul says, we don't wrestle here. This is not where we're fighting. Well, why didn't Jesus come and throw off Rome? Jesus says, I didn't come to fight here. I come to fight here. Oh, praise God. Most of you are going, I see what he's saying. It's only taking an hour, okay? okay? I just keep going till you agree, basically. And then we, so it's this phenomenal picture. This is where the battle is. I, I, it took me a year to get this in my head. All throughout an old covenant title, a, a, a time period. This angel of the Lord says, listen, I want you to take me. When you go in, don't say a thing. Just walk around the city once for seven days or so many days. And then the last day, walk around six times and then yell, because it's already done. We've already, we've already conquered. We, I, I was going to give you a couple other, and I will. Go look up, not now, because we're going to skip it for time. But go look up Daniel chapter 10. He's talking, not now. You're looking. <laughs> go look at Daniel chapter 10 later. Right then, You can re-watch this mess later. But in Daniel chapter 10, Gabriel comes to Daniel and he's venting. He's like, as soon as you started praying, your prayers were heard. But dude, I got hung up in Persia. Oh, there's a mess over there. They're still in Babylon. He's like, yeah, Michael had to come and help me, man. I got to get back there. Here's what's going on. I came to give you this. And then at the very end of that whole chapter, he's like, now listen, by the way, after, after, uh, after Persian comes, dude, that Greeks are going to come. Yeah, there's a whole list. We're, God's doing stuff way down the road. Isn't that incredible? Daniel's like, what are we doing here? He's like, oh, you'll get there. Don't worry about it. This is what's happening. Because the whole deal is here. Remember Elijah? Second Chronicles? It's in there somewhere. At Dothan. And the king, the Aramean kings, like surrounded the city. And, 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 and Elijah's servant goes down 
get, they get up in the morning. He goes down to the Continental Buffet. He's getting all this food for him and, him and uh, Elijah. And he comes back. He's, he's petrified. The whole city is surrounded. And Elijah's like, oh, interns. <laughs> he grabs his servant. It's hysterical. He takes him outside. He says, Lord, open his eyes so he can see. And the hills are covered. That's the whole Old Testament. The major warriors, the major overcomers in an Old Covenant hour and New Covenant, by the way, never lived here. They lived here. Almost at the neglect of here. I'd love to have time to talk to you about the invention of the early monks. Priests weren't monks. The monks got so, the, the, the monastic orders got so obsessed with this idea that they just abandoned everything here and went here. Because they believed living in a desert in a cave, they could do more damage. They're just like, why? Who would come up with that? I know, not going to date anymore. I'm like, really? That's weird. Yeah. That, there's, there's logic. There's a whole history of that. It's a lot of reading. But dude, there's, there's, we, we live in such a, a really unique day. We put so much emphasis here. It's, it's, we default to this. Depression. Can depression be caused from a physical symptom, a physical deal, a physical um, infirmity, like a broken arm, like a baby comes out and has, yes, can it happen? Yes, but don't default there. It might not be physical. In fact, what I found is most of the time it's not physical, it's spiritual. It's called a spirit of heaviness. By the time you come into the New Testament, I can give this to you if you want, come up after and talk to me. I went through the New Testament and I listed, and some of them are Old Testament, 16 demonic types where the enemy expressed the authority that was given to him by mankind to rule in his life. And the kind of place that Jesus walked into. And, the, and how many demonic, oppressive, for instance, pride is a spirit. James chapter 3, jealousy is a spirit. Fear, 2 Timothy chapter 7 verse 1, is a spirit. Infirmity, the woman had a spirit of infirmity, it's a spirit. The deaf and dumb spirit, the heaviness spirit, also depression. The, the spirit of stupor, the antichrist spirit, the spirit of harlotry, seduction, a lying spirit, Romans chapter 1, verses 25 to 27. By that Jesus walks into a world that was completely dominated, mankind had surrendered themselves to the lie and the authority of the enemy. When Jesus took it back, this is so good, when Jesus took it back, he literally took he tells his disciples before he ascends, all authority has been given to me. Do you know what all authority means? It means all authority. Seriously, we have this lie. We have this lie told to us that the enemy is powerful, that the enemy, man, he's, oh, he's, man, you don't, none of that's true. None of that's true. We think like, you know, the world sings about, you know, he's, he's the devil with the pitchfork. Pitch he reigns in hell. No, he doesn't. Hell was created as a punishment for him. He doesn't reign there. Yeah. He has no, like, kingdom. Like in the spiritual realm, like it's like Lord of the Rings, like the land of Mordor, and he's there. No, he doesn't. He doesn't have any of that. Jesus went into the grave and took it all back. He took death captive. Death captive. Captivity captive. That's why in chapter 2, he was called the spirit of the air. Why? Satan has no throne. He has no rule except in the lives of those who let him. That is the only place where he rules. You are never, ever to fear the enemy. Ever. Ever. Why? Because, dude, you, not if, you, if, if you are a child of God filled with the spirit, you are to never fear the enemy. Because he has no authority over you. Now, Let's go quickly. That was the introduction. <laughs> Dude, it's a, there's a lot there, though. There's this lens. And seriously, go back, watch the video, just rewatch it. Do the study yourself. It's unbelievable. You'll be running around your house. Let me give you the other four. We looked at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. 
that our wrestle is not what like, we fight against, what you're wrestling with, what may be going on in your marriage is not here. It's here. Your husband is not the enemy. Your wife is not the problem. This is always, this is always the issue. Always the issue. He begins, and we're going to start in chapter 1 with verse 3. Praise be, we looked at this uh, last night, or Sunday morning. Ephesians chapter 1, what did I say? Yeah, I know. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms. With every single blessing. Now, what's the blessing again? If you remember from Sunday morning, those are the adjectives that describe him. He literally takes every single adjective that describes him and puts it in Christ and then grabs you and sticks you in him. You are equipped in Christ, not in the old covenant. In Christ, you and I are equipped to survive there. You can stand. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10, 11, and 12. You, 13. You can stand. We're going to look at that tomorrow. You can stand. He comes down. <laughs> this is my second favorite one. He says in verse 18, I pray that the eyes of your heart. Did you know your heart has eyes? I went to the doctor. They do not. Did you know that Christians see from here, not here? I've heard that. Jesus looks at the Pharisees and says, you're blind. They're like, oh, I suppose that blind guy can see. Jesus is like, yep. <laughs> you mean, Jeremiah, we're not supposed to see our world from this? Or, but we're to see our world through? One of the greatest, I put something on Facebook about this last night from our YouTube channel. Some of the greatest deterrents to your spiritual growth is here. We have this, we have this deception in our, in, our, in our churches today that somehow God speaks here, we read here, we learn here, and once we understand it, it moves here. I've seen this in children in, who are four and five years old who get radically moved upon by the Holy Spirit. They spend the rest of their life figuring out what went on here. And even though you and I think we have it figured out, most of us, when the Holy Spirit does a neat thing in our life, comes and does, he did some things in some people's life last night. He didn't necessarily explain it to you, but he, see, Christianity has lived here. Does he speak here? Absolutely. Can we learn? Absolutely. But God wants to transform our hearts, then our minds. He purifies our hearts. And then we'll spend the rest of our life being transformed by the renewal. We catch up with this. You don't have to believe me if you don't want to, but I'm telling you. So he says, I pray that the eyes of your heart, not your mind, may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he's called you. He says, listen, I pray that God would open your spiritual eyes that you could know the hope to which he's called you. What's that? The riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparably great power for us who believe. And by the way, that power is like the working of his mighty strength which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. You know what he's saying? He said, I hope you can understand that God would give you revelation, that you could literally see who you are and the power that lives inside of you from the Holy Spirit. The same power that lives in you, the same spirit that lives in you is the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. Same one, exact same one. You didn't get the junior Holy Spirit. You got the same Holy Spirit. And he lives in you. And some of, the, some of the ways I've been working through this in recent months is he literally, he shares my mind. And I'm learning, I'm learning to hear his thoughts. I'm becoming, I'm praying without ceasing. I'm learning to become attentive to his thoughts. And I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm realizing that there's a lot of thoughts that I've had that were his that I've claimed were mine. <laughs> I was like, I'm the man. I'm not the man. He's the man. 
Sorry. And that power seated him, verse 21, far above all rule and authority, power, dominion, get this, and every title that can be given, not only in this present age, but also in the age to come. And God placed all things under his feet. All things. Every title that can be given. Listen to how he finishes this. And he appointed him to be the head over everything for the church. Then he describes the church, which is his body, which is the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. You mean we're the fullness of Christ? You're telling me exactly how Jesus lived, I can live? You're telling me as the Father looks at, Je- looks at me, he sees Jesus? You mean when the enemy looks at me, he sees Jesus? And he tries to convince you that you're not. And then he goes on to the third one in verse 2 of chapter 2, just a couple verses down. No, he didn't. Verse 6. And he says, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ. You are literally seated in the same authoritative position in the spiritual realm that Jesus is. Let me explain that. When you pray, the authority in faith that you pray with is the same authority that Jesus prays with. Just, that's crazy. You have the mind of Christ. You literally, the Holy Spirit wants to reveal to you the same thing that he would reveal to Jesus. You know what my favorite one is? The last one. Chapter three, this is the last reference to the heavenly realms. (laughs) <laughs> this, is, this is the best. We end with this. Verse 10 of chapter 3. And this is in context where God is describing. Uh, see, we've got to give an introduction. So from chapter 1 all the way up to this point, and he'll go into this big lengthy prayer, and then he goes into specific instruction. But up to this point, he's been describing who we are in Christ. That God's plan from the very beginning. Listen to this. Verse, verse 10. His intent, this is God, His intent was that now, listen, through the church, that's through us, the manifold wisdom of God. That means the complete full plan of God for humanity. Why we are here, why he created us. Which he's been explaining up through the first, you know, three chapters, nine verses. It was his intent that was now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. See, I thought he was going to say it should be made known to a lost world. It should be made known to the church. Listen. Everything that we've been talking about, God wants to reveal through his intent. His intent from the very beginning. Why he just didn't smash Satan and why he's let all this go on. God is revealing through the church his intent. The man of his manifold plan. He's revealing that to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, the demonic realm, by saying, you are not in charge anymore. See, all of this is not to convince you. That's ridiculous. This is a big just news flash to the demonic. You, you can't have my kids. Yeah, you don't have authority to come on my property more. You can say that? I don't know. Here's what I've been doing. 100% honest. I heard this from a preacher. I love it. Apple has two departments. They have what they call the quality control part department. Every corporation does. We'll use Apple. But they have the quality control department. And that is like everything that comes out, they have a certain standard of quality that they're going to meet. They control the quality of the product that's coming out. It's called the quality of control. It has to work the way they say it's going to work, quality of control. They also have this other department that's in the back. It's got fence around it, fire extinguishers, warning signs. That's the product development department. It may not be safe. Let's experiment And it's based on rationality and rules and dreams that should work. They just don't go in there and start just blowing up stuff. There's there's intent involved. But it's, 
How does what we, what we what work on paper, how does what works on paper work in the real world? I've lived here most of my life, and I love this. And I preach here. I preach here. But I live, I've been living here. How does this affect the way that I parent? Let me give you a couple examples. I usually have the camera turned off, but. So, true story. I was, uh, oh, which one do I tell you? About uh, two years ago, my Facebook got copied. And they took my picture and they set up this Facebook account with Jeremiah Bullock Ministries and then put .inc on it, which was the addition. Started this page and then began to befriend all of my friends, which is a little interesting that they would actually, well, Jeremiah's only got three friends. I've been following him for five years. But, so they build this Facebook account over a period of months. I didn't know about it. And then they begin to message all these churches and begin to solicit money. Hey, I got this new book coming out. I got this new study. And one day, this pastor sends me this email, and he's like, Jeremiah, why do you sound weird? I was like, I don't know. I don't know. He sends me a text from his phone, the message that I send him. Dear beloved, how art thou doing? I'm like, I'm weird, but I'm not that weird. He goes, yeah, you're asking for money. I was like, what? I go and look at the account. I report it. And then it was a war for like six months. All these pastors calling. It was, it was, I was embarrassed. It was terrible. I showed up to a revival and this lady goes, thank you for praying for me. I was like, no problem. Yeah, you've been keeping in touch with me. I was like, oh, it wasn't me. I mean, I'll pray for you, but it wasn't me. She shows me it was terrible. I battled with that till recently, probably about maybe eight months ago. And I kid you not, I'm studying all this and the Lord speaks to me one morning. He goes, why do you put up with that? I'm like, what do you mean? You're the strong tower. I'm not criticizing, I'm just saying. He's like, you don't have to put up with that. Take authority over it. Do you have sin going on in your ministry? No, I do not. Are you living in sin? No, I'm not. To tell the enemy, you can't, you can't have it because it belongs to me. I was like, I can do that? So I do. I go back into the factory. And I was like, hey, you can't have my Facebook. Is that right? And I did. I just declared it. I, and I know. I just declared it. I said, this ministry belongs to him. And I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. You do not have permission to operate here. Just like I can say, you do not have permission to operate in my home. You do not have permission to operate in my mind. You don't have, you resist the devil and he'll flee. Well, this is my digital world. It's mine. You cannot have it. I have not received one more. And it stopped overnight. And then I was like, you know what? I'm going to start talking about it online. Why? Because I'm not going to live in fear. <laughs> I know everybody's always like, this guy's a crazy. But I'm telling you. What if we had, what if where we seated in Jesus, walking in his authority, where God has placed us, where he's seated us, we can walk into our kid's room and say, Jesus, say, Satan, you cannot have my kids. They belong to Jesus. You can't operate in my family. You can't operate in my neighbor. In fact, you know what? I don't give you, I, I fall in love with him. I take spiritual authority for my properties. I've been doing this. We went out and anointed the road. You know Lebanon. Dude, we, there's all kinds of accidents. Not anymore. Does it work? I'll tell you later. What'd you do? Drive down the road and just throw out olive oil? Did you see me? <laughs> you anointed the high, Why not? What would happen if we walked into our Walmart and said, Jesus, I take spiritual responsibility for this place. And I'm going to come in, I'm going to pick up trash off the ground. And I'm going to congratulate the employees. And I'm going to pray over people there. And I'm only going to speak life in there. 
Is this too much? You're all just kind of like. It's his intent that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be revealed to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. Earth was given to man, not the demonic realm. Seriously. And if people get so uptight over that, I know we got to quit, but people may get so uptight over that. I had, to, I had this guy come at me on Facebook and he's like, you act like, you know, God left us in charge. I said, you ever read that parable where Jesus comes and leaves his servants in charge and leaves, they're beating people and killing their, his son and all this and he comes, yeah, talents. Sometimes I think we pray like Jesus, move in our city, go get it, send a burning bush. I'm gonna sit here and watch, you know, love connection. That's not how things work. He's empowered you. You're the vessel. And you don't go off, hack, hack, you know, just half-cocked, like the, you're, that's a gun expression. You don't just go off just, just doing whatever you want, but you're hearing, and he's giving you spiritual eyes to see. And you're operating, you're living in response, and you're literally loving your world the way the Father does. That's what Jesus did. Jesus didn't come to do what he wanted to do. He was, the expressed, he was the expressed activity of the Father on earth. I, I want to live that way. I, I believe we're called to live that way. I believe we live in a spiritual world that Jesus conquered and gave us all the authority because we're seated in him. So we're literally going to be filled with his spirit. We're going to see our world the way he does. And his desires we're going to announce. And we do it all the time. We look at people that are living in sin and say, you can be forgiven. Well, who gives you the authority to say that? He does. You don't have to believe the lies. We can pray for you to be healed. You can be transformed. You can live free. That's examples of walking in the authority that we have. That my father. And we live that way. And we're launched out into our world and we transform our communities and we allow what's going on there to come here. Why? Because we're seated in Christ in the heavenly realms. We can walk boldly into the throne room now. That's present tense, Paul says. And we can hear and release that into our city. You melancholy group of people. No, it's a lot to take in. Honestly, it's a lot to take in. They lived with a lens. I just want to live with that lens. I mean, I do with all my heart. Do you have it all figured out? Not. And my heart is pure and I pray it all the time, Lord. Can I tell you guys a quick story? <laughs> this is, we went over. I apologize. Is this okay, Sean? Can I, just be, can I be honest with you? I'm a beginner. Sean knows me. Lori knows me. I'm a beginner. I'm a beginner. I didn't even tell you this. So I'm driving home. Last one, and then Sean's going to come. We'll worship and do whatever you want to do. I'm heading home from Missouri last week in revival. And I'm walking with the Lord. I'm, I'm, you know, it wasn't like I did anything different that I knew of. And I prayed with this, the DS showed up. This is hysterical. The DS showed up to the services where I was at, him and his wife. And he came in limping. He had a cane. And I came up to him, I knew who he was. And I said, hey, brother. I said, are you okay? He said, I'll tell you about it later. And so we went out afterwards, and he and his wife, and he shared he had some disease with his foot, and they couldn't get rid of it. And, and it's like something like a diabetic thing, but he wasn't diabetic, and it was like razor blade pain in his big toe, and he couldn't walk, he'd been dealing with it for months, and think contemplating surgery and all this. And I'm like, let's just ask God to heal you. And he's like, that'd be great. So we pray, and nothing happened. I was like, sorry, I'll keep praying for you. I get in my car and I head home the next night and I'm driving along and I kid you not, Holy Spirit just settles on my car and I hear, call the DS. And I looked at my clock. I'm driving home all night. He said, call the DS. Tell him to get out of bed. Tell him to get into the shower and take a shower and sing and praise me in the shower. And when he gets out, he'll be healed. I was like, that ain't happening. <laughs> I've had way too much coffee. I, am, I, can't, I hear you, Lord, I'm going to stop. Dude, it, it nagged at me. It nagged for like 45 minutes, it nagged at me. I was like, I do not believe I'm going to do this. 
He's not going to answer. It's late. Seriously, this is 100%. This is a week ago. So I called. He hung up. He answered on the first ring. Hey, Jeremiah. I was like, oh, oh. hey, man. How's it going? <laughs> yeah, you home yet? No, no, no. Oh, we're praying for you. Boy, it's a great week, all this. Yeah. Just kept lingering the conversation. He's like, okay. I was like, uh, exactly what I said. I said, do you, do you shower at night or in the morning? <laughs> That's exactly what I said. He got real quiet and he goes, I shower in the morning. I was like, well, I think I heard from the Lord. This may not be right, but I have to obey because his presence came on me and I'm telling you, I love you, man. I think I heard. I want you to go get in the shower and I want you to shower and I want you to sing praises and I want you to glorify him. And when you get out of that shower, I believe your foot's gonna be healed. He was dead quiet and he goes, okay. And I hear him get up and I was like, well, just, text me and let me know how things turned out. And he hung up. And I did, man. I stressed out on the way there. And I was like, I, it felt guilty because I was wanting to be healed more for me not looking like an idiot than him being healed, right? Honestly, I was. I'm telling you, this is, it, there's risk with faith. And I thought I heard him. And 45 minutes later, he called me and said, my toe is completely healed. And I was like, pray. I know. it wasn't that kind of praising. I was like, thank the Lord. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I'm going to his district. This is a praise the Lord. But that dude was healed. His foot was healed. I called him yesterday on the way here. You're like, does that happen often? Thank God, no. But it's this quality control department. And I just really believe, and I don't have it all figured out. I'm telling you, I don't have it all figured out. But I'm under the impression, and it's, it's really difficult because you can't strive, but I'm under this impression that we were created. We were created to be the hope. We carry the hope for a dying world. And he wants to use you in the life of your kids and your grandkids and your world. And you just have to stop believing the lies. I told the Lord tonight, I... I've had this severe ear infection. I told the Lord tonight, I said, hey, I had this inclination that maybe we could pray tonight and maybe anybody has any sickness and if there's any, anything going on with us, maybe, maybe, maybe we could just ask him collectively. Maybe we could believe. Does anybody, does anybody believe, honestly, believe that God still heals today? Okay. Like really believes we get asking. And so I'm sitting there, and I called Corinda, and she's got me on oregano oil. I couldn't shut my mouth all the way, and my ear's been hurting. And I just said, Lord, I thought I heard him say, I want, I want to heal some people tonight. And I was like, I shouldn't be nervous, but I am. Forgive me. I said, would you start with me so I'd know? I did, and I put my hand on my head, and I prayed. I got here, and I was like, that dude's healed. <laughs> That's like the Gideon fleece, I think. Yeah, I was like, wow, okay, okay. But I think this is more for, for you than it is me. I'm not a miracle man. I am a normal guy. You can ask him. You can ask her. I'm a normal guy. I'm as normal as they come. Are you listening to me? You carry the same Holy Spirit I do. We did, we, we've got to start living it. I am no longer willing in the name of Jesus. I am no longer willing to preach anything that I don't demonstrate. And I'm not just talking about moral character. Because I'm not going to get out there and say, this is the God I believe in. Oh, then do it. I'm getting all kinds of criticism over the denomination. I've left this, and I'm doing all this now, and all, all that. I'm just like, show up to the service. I'm the same guy. I'm the same crackhead. Just show up. Show up to the service. It's what he's doing. He's ridiculous. He's incredible. I had no idea. I had no idea who we are. And I'm running. And it's not about doing ministry. He's allowing. He's allowing. He's inviting us. I'll tell you, he's allowing me to participate in what he wants to do every week. 
I feel like, seriously, I feel like he's been telling me. I heard this the other day. He came up and he said, what this is all about is not about you and your ministry. He goes, I've just come to you and say, would you like to know what I'm doing? Would you like to come with me? I'd be like, you, yes. I would love for people to feel the way that I feel. I would love for people to feel the way that I feel. I'd love them to be victorious as I'm victorious. That's what he's inviting you into. What if, you, what, if, what if he would just say, you know what? How would you like to go to your job tomorrow and see it through my eyes? It, it changed your whole perspective of work. You'd be up at like four in the morning, your wife's like, what you doing? I'm getting ready for work. <laughs> it's Saturday. Oh, is it really? I'm going to go anyway. <laughs> Why? Because work is no longer about this. Right? Come on. <laughs> Anybody need prayed for? If you need prayed for anything physical, just stand up where you're at. Anyone else? If you don't believe, just watch. If you do believe and you're close to any of these, stand up and put your hands on them. And by the way, it doesn't have to be that spiritual. When I called the DS, I actually forgot to pray with him. <laughs> and I didn't have any anointing oil through the phone. I am so grateful. I am so grateful for you rescuing me. First from the world and second from religion. Thank you for res rescuing me from pride. Thank you for rescuing me from performance, self-absorption. Thank you for re re rescuing me from addiction. You're just better. <laughs> You're just better. I have tasted and I have seen you are exactly what the world needs. And Father, this is our, this is our desire in this room. I don't come for blessing. I don't come to use you. I want to be a part of what you're doing in Lubbock this week. I'm so blessed. I'm so honored to be a part of what you're doing in Lubbock this week. Father, we want to be a part. This, Father, I pray you would convince this church to long to be a part of what you're doing in Lubbock. They carry your spirit. They carry the hope. I thank you, Father to be able to approach you. We're commanded in Scripture to come to you. And we ask you in the name of Jesus, and we plead the blood of Jesus because by his stripes we are healed. And we speak life and healing over everyone in this room right now in the name of Jesus. Father, let the healing, let the healing presence of your personhood flow into their bodies. Father, heal shoulders, heal cancer. Father, heal, heal diseases of the liver. Father, heal spleens. Father, heal arthritis in the name of Jesus. We come against every spirit of infirmity in the name of Jesus. You have no permission to operate here any, in, anymore. You're a liar. You're operating illegally against a child of God. We come out of agreement with you. In the name of Jesus, be gone. And all the areas of our life, Father, heal what we don't even know is wrong. And we will give you all of the glory. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen, amen.